All right, so in our last video, we talked about the gunpowder empires, and now we're on 3.2, and we'll learn more about the administration of those empires. In other words, uh, how are those empires run? So here's the vocabulary you'll need to know. The divine right of kings, basically saying that if you're a king, you have the right to rule because God says so. And so you become the authority of God on earth. You are not subject to the law because you are the law and what you say goes and what you say goes because God put you in charge. Uh, justices of the peace, English bureaucrats responsible for the rule of law in England. Um, English Bill of Rights is a document that limited, the role, that limited the role of powers of the King of England. Excuse me. The English Bill of Rights is a document that limited the role and powers of the King of England. That makes much more sense. Um, absolute means and political authority resides in a single entity or individual. So if you're an absolute monarch, you have all the power yourself. Cardinal Richelieu, uh, along with Louis XIII, was responsible for centralizing power um, in France. Intendants are French bureaucrats who are empowered to act in the name of the French king and carry out his authority. Louis XIV, king of France during the peak of the kingdom. Um, Ivan IV, we saw him last time, but he's responsible for the expansion of the Russian Empire. And we have the Romanov dynasty, which ruled Russia until it collapsed in the 20th century. So if you've seen the movie Anastasia or you know about the Russian Revolution, um, the Romanov dynasty is the dynasty that collapses at the time of the Russian Revolution. Peter I, also known as Peter the Great, is a Russian leader who focused on modernizing and westernizing Russia. The city of St. Petersburg is named after him. All right, uh, next one, the Devshirme. It's a system in which Christian boys in the Balkans, that's like Southern Europe, were contributed to become slaves of the sultans of the Ottoman Empire. It's a fascinating system. We'll learn more about it. The Janissaries, Ottoman soldiers who didn't always, but often came from the Devshirme. Um, they're trained to be elite fighters. It says effective fighters here. If it's on your quiz, it would probably say effective and not elite. So make sure you write it down as it is. Um, Daimyo are the lords in feudal Japan. Uh, the Edo is the historic capital of Japan. Tokyo is built around it. Tokugawa Hideyoshi is a daimo, like a military leader, who was eventually pronounced shogun of Japan, kind of like a military dictator of Japan. The period of great peace is a period of stability in Japan, as you can imagine, I'm sure, as you can imagine. Uh, the Tokugawa Shogunate is a family dynasty who controlled Japan until the 19th century. Askia the Great, West African ruler whose Muslim faith represented a continued effect on the spread of Islam. Excuse me, continued effect of the spread of Islam. He unified the Songhai Empire under Islam. And then we have Akbar, the founder of the Mughal Empire, and then Delhi, capital of the Mughal Empire. More vocab. Shah Jahan is one of the notable leaders of the Mughal Empire. Uh, he funded the construction of the Taj Mahal. If you haven't yet looked up a picture of it, you should look up a picture of it. It's beautiful. Uh, tax farmers, as you can imagine, are tax collectors. And tax farming is the process of collecting taxation. Um, the tributes are political states paying a kind of a tax to more powerful states in exchange for protection. So if you're a, a less powerful state, you might say, yeah, I'll be a tribute of your empire because, you know, I'll give you some money. You make sure no one comes and conquers me, kind of like good for us both. Uh, the zamindars are bureaucratic officials in the Mughal Empire. They were tasked with collecting taxes and organizing public works projects. Uh, the Taj Mahal is a tomb built by Shah Jahan for his wife. It's a fusion of South Asian art and um, Muslim art as well, architecture. Uh, if you haven't looked it up yet, look it up now. Versailles is the palace of Louis, of Louis XIV. Um, it's ornate and it's lovely, and it's expected to house the French nobility. And Louis XIV had this idea that if the French nobility were hanging out in his palace, they'd be less likely to get together and try to figure out ways to have rebellions. Uh, the boyars are the noble landowning class in Russia, um, kind of the nobles, the local lords. And then serfdom, which you learned about before, is that feudal system where peasants exchange loyalty for protection. Um, but the boyars have leverage over them because they're in charge of them. And so that led to um, the serfs being exploited often. If I click this, will it go away? Let's see. Yes, there we go. No, no, no. Bye-bye. All right, so uh, section B, centralizing control in the empire. So summary here, uh, European states centralized on a spectrum, meaning they didn't all centralize the same way. So one thing that some of them did is they emphasized the divine right of kings, as in I am king because God says so. Um, in England, there's a little bit more of a push to have the rule of law as opposed to the rule of a divinely ordained king. 
So you've got England's gentry officials. Uh, they're called justices of the peace. And they're landed gentry. It means they're noble. It means they're aristocrats. They've got money. They've got land. And they're trying to maintain the equal enforcement of laws. Um, and they maintain the system. And so that increases the legitimacy of the government because people are like, oh, they're enforcing the laws. They're good people. We can trust them. We'll trust the government. It's kind of a, a cycle. Um, so England's aristocracy, its gentry, um, is more empowered than in other countries. And so what that means is they're often pushing for rights. If you remember, they pushed um, King John to sign the Magna Carta. And then later they pushed um, King and Queen William and Mary to sign the English Bill of Rights, which again limits the power of the monarchy and it gives at least the nobles uh, some rights. Now, France goes a different direction. They've got absolutism. This is politically the opposite of England. Monarchical authority became absolute. The king says, I am the king because God says so, and whatever I say goes. And if you have any ideas that are against that, you can die or just go hide. So uh, monarchical authority became absolute. Uh, Louis XIII has a minister named Cardinal Richelieu um, who helps him consolidate his authority and keep the monarchy strong. Now, there are intendants um, who are executing the commands of the central government, and they're the ones who go out there and they're responsible for tax farming. So it means they dig in the dirt, and when they dig long enough, they plant their seeds, then they grow taxes, and then they harvest them. No, that's not what happened. Um, they would go out there and they would get taxes from the local peasants and workers. And over time, they were taking more and more taxes and people were having less and less. And this is going to lead to grave consequences for the French monarchy. Um, but Louis XIV eventually becomes the most absolute monarch in Europe. He's got all the power and uh, the, the world kind of revolves around him. So, X and C reigning in control of the Russian Empire. So Russia's size, summary here, Russia's size created unique barriers to centralization that were eventually overcome. So Russia is huge and centralization is extremely difficult. I'm sure you've had teachers showing you this for years, but again, let's go to the map and look how big Russia is. It's so big, it's huge. I mean, a lot of it is very cold and uninhabitable, but it's a big country. Imagine trying to govern something this big big. It's hard to wrap your head around. I can barely wrap the mouse around it. So let's go back over here to the land of the Russian Empire. So it's big, hard to control the whole thing. So you've got local people that you want to kind of put in charge of things. So you've got the boyars who are the landowners and they control huge, huge tracts of land. Um, there's also merchants who are out there buying and selling. And you've got serfs and their peasants who are in a feudal relationship with the boyars. So feudalism continues in Russia way longer than it does say in England and France. The serfs are still, they're not exactly slaves. You can't do whatever you want with them, but they aren't allowed to leave and they have to work. So you can decide if that fits your definition of slavery. Um, Ivan the fourth finds that people are challenging his authority, his local boyars, his, his local nobles are, are challenging his authority. So um, Ivan the fourth would fight back, he'd imprison them, he'd take their lands away, and he had this group called the Oprichnina um, to enforce his interests. And this is sort of like the deep, 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 deep roots of the um, Russian secret police. Um, after that, Peter the Great comes, Peter the First. The Romanov dynasty comes to power because there's a succession crisis. After Ivan IV dies, they can't decide who's going to be king. So Peter the Great becomes the king or the Tsar of Russia. Tsar is a better word of the Russian king. So the Romanovs have a lot of competing interests to balance. They've got the church on one side, very conservative, want to keep things the way they are. The boyars, they want to follow their own self-interest. They want more land. They want more power. They want the Tsar of Russia to be weaker. And then the royal family, of course, wants to centralize their own authority, and they've got their own interests as well. So people are, are battling for power here. Um, Peter the Great does some major things to help stabilize Russia. He defeats his half-sister Sophia in a civil war. I think he later forces her to join a convent. Um, he's able to have some influence over the church. And then after a while, they're like, no, 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 too much. Stop, stop it. Um, but he does reorganize the Russian state and he says, okay, look, we've got all these provinces across Russia. Let me pay some people to run them. So instead of just like fleecing the peasants and taking all their money, I'll pay you money and you just run stuff. Maybe that'll be a better system, make people a little more loyal and a little less um, afraid of the government, a little more supportive of it. So section D, centralizing control in the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottomans use this very interesting system called the Dev Shermay to control their territory and manage it more effectively. 
So the Dev Sherme is kind of like a system of taxing, but they're taxing people. So in the Dev Sherme system, the Ottoman Empire would go into Christian lands in Southern Europe and they'd be like, hey, we rule over you and you got to give us a tax. What's the tax? You got to give us one of your sons. And people are like, one of our sons? The Ottomans are like, yes, one of your sons. So they take one son away and they convert them to Islam. They train them how to fight or how to work in the government. Um, and eventually a lot of these people actually become very important fighters and leaders in the Ottoman Empire. So sometimes they become part of the Janissary Corps, this elite fighting group. Uh, they also learn to be bureaucrats and scribes and task collectors. They do all these jobs that maybe aristocrats from the Ottoman Empire used to do. And the one advantage is that these people aren't from the core of the Ottoman Empire. They're not from powerful Muslim families. And so they're not necessarily full of a sense of entitlement. Like, oh, I should, I should be the sultan. I'm just as cool as the sultan. What, what, is, what does he have that I don't have? Um, these people who are taken from outside the empire are raised to be loyal to the sultan. So they eventually become um, some top advisors. And so in some ways, there are some parents that are like, yeah, Maybe my child will go from being this peasant in Southern Europe to being an important leader in the Ottoman Empire. So not everybody was totally upset to have one of their sons go join this system. You can think of it as a kind of intolerance, as in, you know, the Muslim Ottoman Empire are sort of doing bad things to Christian Europe. And at the same time, it's allowing these boys who are from these poor little villages to possibly move up into positions of power and influence. All right, centralizing control in East and South Asia. So summary here, East and South Asian states consolidate their control through cultural institutions, military force, and the delegation of responsibilities. So um, the Ming Dynasty comes up after the Yuan Dynasty. And the Yuan Dynasty, if you remember, was run by or started by Kublai Khan. He's a Mongol. And the Ming think that's not good because they're not ethnically Chinese and the Ming are. And so they try to like push out the, any sort of history of the, Ma, of the Yuan dynasty and sort of rebuild what they consider to be kind of classic China. So they emphasize the civil service exam and, they, and then the Qing dynasty after them kind of builds what the Ming dynasty did before. Now in Japan, um, it's interesting and it's different from some other places. So there are these shoguns who are like local leaders, kind of local lords. This is a very cool sounding name, shogun. Um, and they've got authority from the emperor. And then the daimo uh, is a system where authority is decentralized because the different shoguns all have their own military groups. And that keeps Japan from kind of coming together as, as one country for a while. So um, Oda Nobunaga used gunpowder weapons and he takes over the area around Kyoto. Uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, he builds on that. And then there's a group called the Tokugawa Ieyasu, which eventually controls all of Japan. And the Tokugawa Shogunate rules over Japan until the uh, mid to late 19th century, what's during what's called the Great Period of Peace. So Japan eventually comes together. Um, the government centralizes its authority but there's also still kind of a feudal system going on. So it's not really like, say, in France, where the king rules everything. Um, it's a little more decentralized, and you've got these local areas that are kind of under local control. All right. Now, consolidating Mughal power in South Asia. Um, Akbar is known as the most capable ruler, and his capital is Delhi, where he gave all people the right to appeal to the government in any lawsuit. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in... I think it was in Russia. Um, he used these people called zamindars to administer the empire. And the idea is that they're given some land and they're supposed to rule over it. These folks collect taxes, which I guess is different from the Russian folks. They collect taxes, but they're also incentivized to manage the land well because they're in charge of all the land. If the land does well, they do well. So it's kind of like a win-win for everyone if it all works out the way it's supposed to. All right, so over here, legitimizing power through religion and art. Summary says, the resources consolidated by states made art more monumental. So again, people are trying to find ways to legitimize their power. In other words, people in power want the people under them to feel like they deserve to be in power, to feel like their power is legitimate. So uh, Peter builds the city of St. Petersburg, um, and he plans it out in a grid, and he takes these boyars, these local nobles, and says, you're going to go move somewhere else. You're not going to be here trying to take my power away. 
Um, Askia the Great of Songhai, which used to be Mali, which used to be Ghana, same area, different empires. Um, he made a big Hajj to Mecca. Uh, he made Islam the official religion. And as you know, the Songhai Empire is bigger than Mali, which is bigger than Ghana. And so Islam's continuing to spread across West Africa. Uh, Shah Jahan, we mentioned last time, he built the Taj Mahal, a tomb for his wife. And again, it's a fusion of South Asian and Islamic art. Um, the Ottomans in Constantinople, which becomes Istanbul, not Constantinople, because you can't go back to Constantinople because you're living in Istanbul. Um, Constantinople becomes Istanbul. It's the end of the Silk Road, like the sort of end point into the Mediterranean. And the Ottoman Empire expands across the Bosphorus, and they take a cathedral um, called the Hagia Sophia and change it into a mosque. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. You should also look that up in addition to the um, Taj Mahal. And you can also just look up beautiful buildings of Constantinople and you'll see some really cool stuff. Um, in French, Louis builds his palace in Versailles and he has the nobles visit so they can't hang out in their home territories and plan revolts. And how are these empires financed? So summary here is the states devised means of more efficient taxation that gave them more resources to expand their influence. So in Russia, you've got state-owned industries raising funds. You've got private industries as well, though not as many. Um, and if necessary, they are not afraid to force people to work. Um, in the Ottoman and Mughal empires, they do this thing called tax farming, uh, where they assign people to collect taxes for the government in exchange for keeping some of the revenue. Um, but the Zamindars, which are given power by the um, by the Mughal Empire, they can be corrupt because they're you know they're given a lot of power over this area, and if they want to take more taxes, you know who's watching? They're in charge. Um, in the Ming Dynasty, there's also some tax farming, um, and at first they're looking for things like products from the peasants, like say the things they grow. Um, later, they are looking for silver, and then during their decline, uh, the Ming Dynasty eventually ran out of money. Um, due to some wars that did not go well. Um, also important to know that empires are financed through tributes. Um, stronger states are extracting tax from other states in, chain, in exchange for some protection. Kind of like, hey, you need protection. I don't need protection. Well, if you don't need protection, you need protection from me. So pay me some money. Um, and then from Korea, for instance, is paying some money to China. Um, other states are paying the Aztecs over the um, over in the Americas. Um, the Niger Valley, there should be an I there between N and G. Um, they're paying things, uh, they're paying money to the Songhai Empire. And that's the end of this video. Be sure to make note of any questions you have so you can ask your teacher before your quiz. And I will see you in the future times.